the beautiful faces. God is so good. You guys know that? This is a great day in history we celebrate, right? Because if he didn't get up, why are we all here, right? Why are we here if he didn't raise up out of that grave? But he said, there's that one song. I don't know if you guys heard that song. It says, ain't no grave going to hold me down. Right? I think Johnny Cass sang it, and then there's a lady that sings it now, more modern one. But ain't no grave going to hold us down either. We're going to all rise up one day. We're going to hear that sound. And uh, we're either going to be alive and changed, or if we happen to go to sleep for a while, we're going to hear it, and ain't no grave going to hold us down either. Right? Death has lost its sting. Amen? Well, got a few announcements. Uh... We have a rummage sale coming this Saturday. I don't think that's changed, so they're going to be doing a big rummage sale. It's in the social hall. So if you have anything you would like to donate for the rummage sale or anything you would like to buy to uh, build up some more stuff at the house, I know a lot of us have accumulated quite a bit of things. If you want to accumulate more, there'll be stuff for sale on Saturday. So uh, whatever uh, your desire is there, it's available. A um, couple birthdays. Tim Frankowitz ain't here today, but his birthday's coming up Tuesday. So if you happen to run into him before then, tell Tim happy birthday. I don't know how old he is. He didn't share that information with me. But he's probably getting up there like the rest of us. 21. All right. And then uh, Micah Huff. She does our, uh, our slides. It's her birthday on Thursday. If you see her, tell her happy, birth happy birthday. She's, uh, she had to go home. She wasn't feeling well, so pray for her. My wife took off. She'll be back. Also, let's see. Wednesday, we're going to have a, Brian Wells will be speaking again. Those of you that come Wednesday, do you like Brian? Does pretty good. Yeah, he's a good Bible teacher. I, I, I found it's, it's very nice. So he'll be here again this Wednesday. Of course, we're going to be meeting in the fireside room in the little uh, patio area. And maybe if it's weather permitting, we might set up a table out here or two like we did this morning. And so that will be Wednesday. And remember to just keep praying for our prayer requests there in the bulletin and Others, uh, Janine still needs prayer. Pastor Larry still needs prayer. I'm sure uh, uh, Celia, I think I'm saying that right. Celia, Dan's mother, probably needs prayer and everyone else on there. And then just pray for one another. The Bible says to pray for one another, right? Pray for and pray without ceasing, it says. So how do we do that? We just talk to God like we're talking to one another. Just through the day, as he'll lay someone upon your mind, just say a prayer for him, all right? That's how the Spirit's moving in you, you know? And that way we cover one another. Times are, are difficult, but we encourage one another through, through praying for him and encouraging him in person and things like that. Other than that, you ready to worship our king? The one that death couldn't hold? The one that has all the victory? All the power over death, hell, and the grave. That guy. You guys want to worship him? I think they got some songs for us about that. Amen. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for letting us enter into your presence boldly, Lord, even as Hebrews says, to come before your throne to worship you. Help us to lay aside every weight and everything that would distract us. Help us to focus only on you, for you are our desire, Lord. You are the one we hunger and thirst for. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. All right. Good morning, church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Let's lift this up to our King this morning. See you. 
is a land, worthy is a praise, worthy is the one who is to welcome the grave. Did the people dance, did the people see? Worthy is the mighty king, worthy is a land, worthy is a praise, worthy is the one who is to welcome the grave. Did the people dance, did the people see? Worthy is the mighty king, worthy is a land, worthy is a praise, worthy is the one who is to welcome the grave. Did the people dance, did the people see?
We're not singing about the death of Jesus, but we're singing about the life of Jesus. That he conquered the grave, that he came back three days later. No grave could hold him, no sin could tie him down. So let's sing this today. Let's lay down our crowns at the foot of the cross. Yes. Yeah. 
You know we all been bought with a price, right? The precious blood of Christ has paid the price for us all. And not only that, when we come to him, he goes, here, I'm going to give you a crown, right? So one day, when you stand before me, you can lay it back down and bow before him and say, King Jesus, I love you, Lord. You're my all in all. I've made you my Lord both now and then. And forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, give the Lord a big hand clap. And our, our worship team, gosh, always stepping it up. Amen. It's really good. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, take that time of the morning. We take an offering. There again, the word says, don't do it under compulsion. Don't do it like, I have to do this. Do it because you love Christ. And ask the Spirit of God within you, who is very capable to tell you what you should do at any given time, what it is you should do. And he will make it clear to you. And he not only says that, he says that he will bless us in our giving, whether it's of our time, whether it's of our resources, whether it's of our finance, whatever it is. God loves a cheerful giver. So we want to be cheerful. We want to be joyful because that's what he says to do. And it says, obedience is better than sacrifice, right? So, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time of offering to help just offset costs, Lord, whatever they may be here. You know what the needs are, Lord. 
And so we just thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you for each person represented here today, those that could make it and those that couldn't, Lord. They're still part of our family. We have a very large family, both in heaven and earth, even as your word says. And Father, I just ask you would just speak to the hearts of your people and they would give according to whatever it is you've put upon their heart in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. And after they go by with the offering, you feel free to get up and, and move around and greet one another. And also at that time, too, I think that we can release our children for the children's uh, ministry. If there's any uh, young children in here, I know uh, Pam's not here, but Mary's here. I don't know if she's staying in or if she's going. Uh, my wife's willing to go as well. We need that second person. So, Amen. So get up and greet, greet one another. There's, there's new people that are here visiting part of our family because God has a big, big family. You guys remember that song years ago? It's a big, big house. It's my father's house where we can play football, where we can eat lots of food, right? It's a big, big house. And it's not just represented here.
Hallelujah. I think it's the slide Sam says he's alive. There's a PowerPoint in there. There you go. Thank you. You can just let that go. Then we'll just play. We'll just kind of flip through. See, now he's alive. Even all creation praises him, right? The squirrels, the birds, they're singing every morning. You guys notice that? I don't see too many of them walking around bummed out or with their head down like they're depressed or anything. They're, they're happy. Man, they're just like, he's alive. Right? And it said that the first Adam, you know, he, he, he done messed up. And then we were all born into this thing called sin where we're struggling. Right? But God had a plan. And he sent the second Adam. We know him as Jesus Christ. And it said that the first Adam was what? A living soul. And we know that a soul can only receive life. It can't give life. So Adam really couldn't give life spiritually, only in the natural. But the second Adam came, Jesus Christ, died and suffered, broke the power of sin, defeated hell in the grave, rose again, and he came back as what? A quickening spirit, which is, means a life-giving spirit. The life is in the spirit, and God has imparted his spirit within us when we believe in him and we have life. So there's a lot to say, I'm alive because of him. Jesus is alive. Death could not hold him, right? So it's awesome. That's just a prelude. We're getting there. So my message is he is alive. And a lot's going to be talked about on the third day he rose again. We're going to get into that third day thing and see, why was it the third day? Why wasn't it the first day? Why wasn't it seven days? Do you ever wonder that? What's three got to do with it? What does the third got to do with it? And there's really a lot that it has to do with it, and we're going to look at that. And hopefully that will bring more of an understanding and an appreciation of the things that he's done for us, right? So if you have your Bibles and text, uh, we're going to go to Matthew 24, or Luke, I'm sorry, Luke 24, and I'm just going to read 1 through 8, and then I'm going to chat a little. And this is, in my Bible, the little heading says, He is risen. Of course, that wasn't in the original context. There really wasn't chapter or verse in the original uh, manuscripts. It just was a run-on story, and it continued just like Christ still continues today, right? It's not fragmented. It continues. But in Luke 24, 1, it says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? What are you looking for? He's not here. He's not dead. Why are you looking for, for someone that's alive? You're looking in the wrong place. The graves, the sepulchers, they're not the place to look for living people. That's what they're saying. Why, why are you here? And they, and they were perplexed. Well, we know we stuck them in here just the other day. And they put that stone across there to seal it. And where's the two guards, you know? that were supposed to be standing guard, they were perplexed because it wasn't as it was when they left it. And they came back and it was different. So then he, they go on, and these are angelic beings. He says, he's not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee. So now they're saying, don't you remember what he said to you? They're probably more perplexed at that point. I don't remember seeing you guys there when he was talking, right? Because the angelics can come and go. They can be there and we don't even know it. 
They're probably in here right now, I'll tell you the truth. They're just hanging out with us right now. We just can't see them unless God, like, opens your eyes to see that. For them, he opened their eyes, and they spoke and said, he's not here. He's risen, right? And then they go on and say, the Son of Man must be delivered. This is their reminding him what he said in Galilee. This is what he said. He said, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and the third day raise again. The third day. There again, my question, why not the first? Why not? Why not an hour from then? Why not 10 minutes from then? Seven days, six days. But there's, there's specifics here of third day, and it has uh, spiritual meanings that God put way back in Genesis. We're going to go look at it, and we're going to come forward from there. So in verse 8, and he says, and they remembered his words. Oftentimes we need reminders of what God has said, right? And he said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you a helper. In the Greek, called the paraclete. It's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that lives in us, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of truth. He lives in us to help bring to our remembrance everything Jesus has said. So we see that this is like a precursor to that, that spirit coming, that it's going to be a reminder to us. Some of the perplexing questions for those who deny Christ's resurrection, right? Just some food for thought here before we get into the meat of our message here. What became of his body if he did not rise, right? What became of it if he did not rise? If, full, if, if enemies came and stole it, as some claim, would they have not produced it when they were saying that he had risen again as proof that, no, see, he's really still dead. But nobody presented any proof. Their allegations that he had risen again were never refuted by anybody to bring a body that might have been stolen out of the tomb and say, here, look. He's still dead. We just came and took it. No one did that, right? So another thing. So they didn't produce a body to disprove the allegations that the apostles were saying he had risen again, and every believer since then, the rest of us included, we're still saying he's alive, right? And there's nobody bringing a dead body saying, you're wrong, look. It's just not happening. If friends had taken it, they would have certainly removed the burial garment or would not have removed the burial garments, right? They would have took him in haste to get away because there were two Roman guards standing there. And then how'd they roll the stone away to be able to do that, right? So just food for thought. People say, oh, he was stolen away or... They, his disciples took him, right? And, and said, well... They wouldn't have folded the grave cloth nicely and put it down and took the time to do all that with two guards standing out front, stopping them from first rolling the stone away and then taking the body, right? But so he's alive, I'm convinced. So God's not dead, he's alive. He rose again displaying four things. His victory over sin and death, that was one thing that he did. His deity, that he was truly who he said he was. He was God, Emmanuel, God among us. Because only God could do that. Only God can bring life, right? It was from the beginning, so he spoke life into nothing. He formed it out of the ground and spoke life into, and Adam came about. Everything that we see, he created. So he is deity. It was the word of God that created all things. We see that in John 1, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by the word of God. And then later it says, and he dwelt among us. He became flesh, just like us. He also raising, he showed us if he raised, if he was able to defeat death and hell and raise, so can we through him 
He says, I'm not going to leave you orphans or comfortless. I'm going to send you the helper, the paraclete, to be with you, to seal you for such a time as when I call and you too will raise. Like I was saying earlier, ain't no grave going to hold any of us down. No, nothing, even Paul says what in, in Romans, I believe, what shall separate us from the love of God? Neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things future, whether angelic, demonic, whatever, anything cannot separate us from the love of Christ, what is found in Christ Jesus. And then also he rose because he's alive forevermore and death no longer can control him. Death is an enemy of all that's good. Death came in when the deception came in back in the garden and has been running freely ever since. But it will, one day death will be defeated completely. Right now Christ has shown his victory over him and defeated him, but it says in Revelations he is the last enemy to be cast into the lake of fire. So death is kind of like a person or something because it's gonna, he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. He's an enemy. But Christ defeated him. There's no sting anymore. It says that it's given unto men once to die when we stand before God. So, so death has a purpose. I kind of liken it like this, right? You guys seen them old shows where you go into the, and these people got their luggage and they go cruising into the, to the little hotel room. There's this guy dressed in like this red suit all buttoned up and a little collar and he's got a little hat on and he's smiling and he's at the, at the elevator, right? He goes, where are you going? And so we come up and he goes, oh, you're one of them hallelujahs. You love Jesus. Going up. Oh, you, yeah, you should have took Jesus. Going down. Right? That's all he is. That's all death is anymore. He's like a bellhop at an elevator. There's no sting. There's no death. There's, he, he can't, there's no, like, fear of that because he's a door to get to the other side that's far greater than where we're at right now. It's just a necessary process we all have to go through. There's no sting because we're alive. We know we're going to live with Christ forever, right? Because he has risen. He's not dead. So we're wondering about these three days. Why was it the third day, not the second, the first, whatever, right? So let's look back. The number three means this. When you look at three in the Hebrew... It means harmony, new life, and completeness, right? The Godhead is three, and it's complete. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three are one. It's complete. They're unified. But it speaks of these things, harmony, new life, and this. So let's look at Genesis chapter 1, and we'll read verse 11 through 13. Like I said, we're going way back to see what this third day thing is or these threes, triads, whatever you want to call them. So in 11 through 13, it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. There's that third right there. And that's a clue because that's where it started, this third day thing. And we'll see a pattern that will go throughout all of Scripture leading up to Christ on this third day thing. Because basically the third day was, it was something that came out of dry land, right? And brought forth life, plants, trees. <laughs> Excuse me. And trees with seed and fruit. It was new life sprouting from the ground, a place that before was non-existent and dead. It was just dirt. 
So we see that. Those, those things were what just happened on the third day, that there was life that came out of it and things like that. In Genesis 124 through 27, now we come to the second series of third. So we did three days, now we do another three, and we come to the sixth day. Let's look at what this three days brought about after the first three that brought us to the sixth day before God rested. In 124, it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. There again. Out of the ground came life. Out of something that was dead came life. So we see this pattern here, that out of this place, they came forth and they were bearing seed and fruit in and of itself. So for man, man being the pinnacle of God's creation, right? Because humans are unique to everything else. We are. We were created in God's image. We're the only thing of creation that he says that about. He says God entered covenant with man, right? He made a covenant with us, and God's instructions were given. These are things we see at the beginning about these third days. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That was instruction given to man he says don't eat of this one tree that was instruction given to man he says i've made covenant with you i will watch over you protect you i will be your god i'll be your father you will be my children all those things happened at the beginning that came out of something dead he brought life and made covenant with right so we see this pattern in genesis 1 This day of the third, it corresponds to a, 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 a sphere of operation or an area of operation that's performed two acts of creative power. In the third, land was clothed with vegetation. In the sixth day, it peopled with the animal kingdom. First, the lower animals were called into being, then to crown it all, man. We're the crown of his creation. And he's going to give us what? Crowns that we can give back to him. Amen? So this pattern, we see that God creates new life where there once was death. We saw that in Genesis 1, 11, 26. We see that he established his covenant. We see that in Genesis 1, 28 through 29. So 1, 28, 29, it says, Then God blessed them and said be fruitful multiply fill the earth subdue it have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth god said see i have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food he says this is all yours i've made this this for you and i've put you here right so he established the covenant and then he it takes place in eden which is a high place oftentimes we'll see that pattern as we're going through where god creates new life where there was death he establishes a covenant and it takes place usually in a high place see eden it doesn't necessarily say in there that eden was a high place but if you really think about it how can Four rivers run out of or through Eden and it not be a high place, elevated. It's not in a valley. It couldn't be in a valley because all the rivers run into that one place, but they don't run through it and keep going. It just kind of ends up there like our new Tulare Lake, right? All the water ran from the mountains into that. 
So it's a high place. Further example of these things we see in Abraham's life, right? When he took his son, and this you find in Genesis 22, verse 1 through 19. We won't read it specifically. If you're taking notes, I would encourage you to do that. But God brought new life to Isaac, sparing his son. I mean to Isaac, sparing his life, and to Abraham, because he received his son back. We saw that in verse 13 of that chapter. He reaffirmed his covenant in verse 16 through 18. And in verse 2, we see that it took place on a mountain in a high place. There again, you see that third day, the three things. Because in this scripture, he says on the third day, go up to that mountaintop when you read it. So in that third day, what, life came when there was basically death. Not only did life come, but there was a substitution for the life given, which is a whole nother story we talked about last week. So life was given. He reaffirmed his covenant with Abraham. He says, because you've done all these things, I will not withhold this from you. I'm going to covenant with you and your generation of people after you. And it was on a high place. Israel at Mount Sinai, we see the third day thing again in Exodus 19, 2 through 16, right? It says the third day here is mentioned four times. It talks about the third day four times in this small section. I think God wants us to pay attention to that. Usually when it's just once, it's one thing, but when it's a couple times, let's pay attention. But four times, that's a lot. And it happened in verse 11, twice, 15 and 16 of Exodus 19, 2 through 16. And God brought new life for his people, a new identity for Israel out of what was once dead, right? They were basically enslaved to Egypt. They were as good as dead, basically, just impoverished. And God said, I'm going to bring you out on the third day with new life. He reaffirmed his covenant on a mountaintop when he gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. It was a new covenant that was given to the people of Israel. And we see that third day does those same patterns. New life on a mountaintop and a covenant reaffirmed or given. In Hosea, we'll turn to that one. Chapter 6 of, Ch of Hosea. A little tiny book right in front of Joel, if you have your Bibles, and right after Daniel. Hosea 6, verse 1 and 2 says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. So they're saying, Okay, we're dead. We've departed from him. We've left the one that brings life. And we're looking to get life because we're in death now. We're, we're having all these wounds. We're having all this craziness going on. And in verse 2, it says, after two days, he will revive us. So he says, let's return to him. And he's going to revive us. But look here. On the third day. He will raise us up that we may live in his sight. There's that third again. Third day brought new life that we might live. Right? Jonah 1.17. Turn a few books over towards the right. You'll run into Jonah. And in verse 117... Oh, gosh, I'm having a hard time finding it myself right now. Do, do, do. Zechariah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk. There we go. Jonah 1.17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Some people's translation says whale. Nonetheless, it was big, enough to swallow a man, whatever it was. It says, 
Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. There's that three again. So here we fast forward through that, and Jesus actually spoke about Jonah in Matthew 12, 40, 16, 4, Luke 11, 30, if you're taking notes. And he says, an evil and wicked generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given but that of Jonah. Just as he was three days in the belly of the whale or the great fish, whatever it was, the Son of Man will also be three days in the earth. Right? So now Jesus is tying this three to himself. Why was it the third day he raised and all that? Remember, covenant, new life, all that. It all ties in to why it was the third day and why it's so important. So just like in Jonah's case, right, he's in there three days, he's dead, as good as dead. God causes the fish to swim up towards Nineveh where God had told him to go originally and just vomited him out. That's what the word says. He went, here's Jonah. I know a lot of people like to elaborate on that, like, you know, stomach acid, bleached clothes, and seaweed hanging off his ears, and just a mess, right? Sometimes that's what it looks like coming out of death, right? Some of our lives were pretty messy when we came out of that death and came to life, right? I know mine was. Good grief. I probably looked terrible. But God does wondrous things in our sight, and it's an amazing thing all the time, what he's doing. So just like Jonah. So Jesus mentioned three days, 21 times in the gospel, right? The third day is God's pattern for creating new life and establishing a covenant. Let's look at some scriptures here. In Matthew 27, because our king is alive, hallelujah, God is not dead. Here we see 27, 63, he says, and this is like the Pharisees came to him and says, hey, you know what? He says, sir, we remember while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise, right? So even they picked up on that. He said, hey, three days, he's going to rise. But yet, that was one of their issues with him was that he said, hey, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up, right? And they were going like, man, our fathers built this thing. It took them 40 years, right? 40 years to build this thing, and you're going to destroy it and build it in three days? Yeah, you're crazy, right? But they were stuck in this place called the natural. That's all they could see, the natural. Even here, they're saying, that guy, while he was still alive, to him, to them, the Pharisees, he was dead. They said, hey, but he said in three days he was going to rise. But before they were accusing him, saying, yeah, this 40 years to build this thing. But now they're concerned about him being who he said he was all of a sudden. Said, and he says, oh, well, you have what you need. Go put the stone over and I'll put a couple guards there. Didn't help him, did it? Ain't nothing going to hold God back, man. Nothing will hold him back from coming to rescue you. Nothing will hold him back from from delivering you, if, if he wants you, he'll pursue you, right? He says he'll leave the 99 to go get the one that's went astray, as such were some of us. So after three days, Jesus would rise again, they said. Mark 14 was, spoke that same story about the Pharisees coming. Mark 8, 31, let's look at that. We're seeing all these times that Jesus said three times, three times. Mark 8, 31, it says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the, 
by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. There again, three days. In Mark 15, 29, they reviled him about you who that would destroy the temple. Go ahead and, uh, and raise yourself. Come on down off the cross, right? They ridiculed him about that three-day thing and what he had said. John 2, 19, 21 is where he said that he would, if they would destroy this temple, he would raise it up in three days. And then in Acts 10, 40, there were witnesses to the third day raising, many witnesses that saw and in fact attested to he's alive. If I could have the worship team come. I have just a few more. 1 Corinthians 15, 4. This is very, we see that this three days is a new covenant we get life out of death. And it usually took place on a high place. Our king suffered on, on a place called Golgotha Hill. It was a high place. And he formulated and brought life where there was death to many of us. Today, we stand alive and spiritually alive because of him. And we're connected to God. Some of us maybe may not have that experience. If so, I encourage you to come forward and we'll pray with you after this service and uh, lead you in a prayer to introduce you to the one that brings life if you happen to need that. But uh, he also brought what was called a new covenant. And next week, that's what we'll be talking about, the new covenant tying in off of this. But he suffered on a hill and brought a new covenant to mankind called the new covenant. In 1 Corinthians 15, 4, Paul says this in his writings, and, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Well, you say, okay, what scriptures are you talking about, Paul? If you would, go to Psalm 68. And we'll see one of the ones that speak about that. A very key one about that. In Psalm 68, verse 19 and 20. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation, Selah. Think about that. Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs escapes from death. We have escaped death. Death no longer holds a fearful place in our life. We don't have to be afraid of the unknown or what's going to take place. We know where we're going. Because he said, where I am at, you will be also. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. We get to that part and it's like, oh, I'm homesick, Lord. I'm looking forward to it. How about y'all? I mean, that's why it hits me. I'm like, oh, gosh. It's going to be awesome. Beyond description, right? So we've escaped death. It no longer has a hold on our life. We've been set free in Christ. The cross was a time... Literally, a victorious death, supposedly. Supposedly, they looked and said, wow, we've won, right? We've been victorious. Death has won, right? But sin was defeated. Nothing positive was put in place until the resurrection. Sin was defeated then. 
But the things that came after that third day when he came out and said, I'm making a new covenant with my people, right? I'm bringing life where there was death because of what the first Adam did, right? That's when the victory came. He, he took over. The resurrection showed that Jesus did not succumb to the inevitable result of sin. The resurrection is proof of his conquest and victory over those things that would have kept us from being part of his family. Amen? Love you guys very much. Nothing you can do about it. I think we're going to sing a song. Let's do that. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So this last song we have is Glorious Day. In the chorus it says, You call my name. Out of the darkness I came running into that glorious day. Sing this together. For it is a glorious day, our King rose.
Say this. Because he lives, I live. And not just any old life, abundant life. Right? That's what he said. We have abundant life in Christ. Amen? Well, if anyone needs prayer, seriously, we're here. We'll pray. Come on up or reach out to someone around you. Everyone got the spirit in them around here. They can pray for you as well. But if you want prayer up here, come on up. Don't forget there's bread in the back. There's still a lot of food out there. Please take some. Or in the kitchen. Maybe they moved it in there, but it's there. Take some with you. All right? Get some stuff. Remember, Wednesday night we'll have our our fellowship in here, but it's going to be kind of displaced from the social hall because we'll be setting up for the rummage, but we'll still be having it. And uh, as you go, walk with the king. Be a blessing. Reach out to people around about you. Encourage people. Smile. You have a lot to be happy about. We serve a risen king, and he's for you and not against you. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the time we get to spend with our families on this Easter celebration, Resurrection Day. For truly, you have arisen, you're alive, and you brought life to us, Lord. We thank you for it. Help us to walk circumspect before you throughout this week and to acknowledge you in all the things round about us because truly you are ever with us everywhere we go. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Love y'all. Thank you, Lord.